Again, standing for us that threatens that fundamental right. As an international organization, we are horrified by violence against free expression. And I urge us all to support individual artists in their work, whether that work be written or visual, in music, or film, or any other means of communicating individual belief systems. I trust you all join me in the horror of this act of violence against Solomon, who was here at the dinner table just weeks ago, and indirectly against us all in any creative field of endeavor. In a world that's ever more divided, we must unite in supporting voices of potential Solomon issues and all of us. I usually look at the sermon <laughs> wonderful talks. So let's get right at it. Um, our very first speaker is Vicki Alexander, who is a visual artist from Canada. I thought, well, the worst thing you can do with a big space is try to fill it. Because it looks like you're not just like the work out. So I thought I would try to make these kind of exquisite jewels and just put them on the ground and not compete with the architecture itself. So these are sculptures that I made of gigantic glass, which is glass that has um, it's three layers of glass and sandwiched between two of them are two different color layers. So when we see it, it's not always clear what we're like the color shifts. You know what I mean? To go around it or it's light, it's it. So they're glued, it's it's like it's just kind of plate glass, it's like half an inch thick. And um, they're glued with a light that fuses to sweat on ultraviolet light, so you can't see the, the seams very well. So they sort of impl they imply furniture, very simple furniture, modernist furniture, but the style is non-specific and they're clearly not functional. <laughs> also, that's the thing back so I'm sorry. I actually I also do collage work, and so on two of the walls are the big vinyl murals that I made. They start with small collages like eight and a half by eleven, and then they get scanned and uh, turned into wallpaper, basically. And I use all different kinds of materials. I use origami paper, um, images from magazines, shopping paper, pretty much anything. This is this thing. Okay. Sorry, this is a similar one. A similar type piece this is in Germany last year. <clears throat> This is an early piece from the 1980s that I did for a billboard project in Vancouver. It's just school work that's being um, re looked at or even re examined. And these are the works that I most, um, they're the most recent, so the ones that I'm most interested in right now. Again, these are collages. And they were based on engravings from Versailles, of the, the water colleagues of Versailles when they're on. So I simplified, they took copies, I made simplified versions of the etchings, which were really detailed. So I got rid of like the people and the dogs and the, anything else that was extraneous, and I just left it with it, the fountains and the background and the foreground. And all these are from 
I guess we just saw all things from magazines. Like it's like I think that's the two years of the COVID. <laughs> when actually, it looks like hard to find magazines for a while. Like I was like, you know, there's stop playing them out. So I also used my own murals, and, and they went on. I got a little more lyrical, like the fountains, the water didn't have to be blue, and the sky could be a couple of different things. So they tend to take on their own. So it's not necessarily identifiable, but they go back to the side. It's um, I have to start small. So I think this is the kind of work I'm going to try to make in Shibatella because it seems like if I get enough magazines mm -hmm. and then uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> So there's a lot of castles here, so I'm working with the castles in the mountain. And I think it could work out. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs>
check. That they create items on this. <laughs> All the paintings and sculptures are from the last four years or so. textbook. Thank you. Thank you. It's not very clear when you hear the album, but I thought it would be very interesting if I could do that and I'm very interested to hear it. And you know, other people have that information. Um, <clears throat> so in 2013, 2014, I became really obsessed with uh, classical Arab music, which is from 1890 to 1920. And um, I was listening to a lot of positions and performances on the time. The line between musician and composer and singer were very diverse, so we were, we were everything at the same time. Um, and let me give you a bit more context. Um, I come from, like, I, I used to listen to a lot of noise. So I think also this makes sense if you're in Cairo, which is the energy and the complexity and noise, so the microwaves will be a bit more loud. Um, <laughs> I also, I think maybe this is something similar to maybe in Italy. Egypt is the Ministry of Culture and the money usually goes to renovating and restoring the museums and the mummies and the, the pyramids. So new new projects and new artists don't really always have the support that they need to keep their career. Um, also, I was um, a bit like in that context, it was after the 2011 revolution. And um, there, there is a generation that was very much wanting to hold on what art is or should be. And as a younger um, generation, we were kind of finding all kinds of ways to be challenged and still make our own. And I found, found refuge, a lot of refuge in the 1890s and 1920s music, and I found a lot of magic and futurism in that kind of music. Um, maybe contextualizing what Arabic or Egyptian music could sound like today, but taking from a time that is even older than what the, per the current older generation were kind of holding on to as what well should be the romantic and, and Baga and um, ideal Egyptian music. Um, 
And also, it was really related to me also being noisy and making noise mm -hmm. because <laughs> the fingers of time were really adjusting and really big and loud noises. Um, I'm going to read for you um, something from a text that I wrote that was published in the Wire magazine in 2018. Over the past three years, I have been engrossed in the discovery of the future music of the Arab world from the 1890s to the 1920s. I have fallen in love with this music and obsessed about it. In the process, I realized there is a huge difference between nostalgia and falling in love with something from the past, particularly when it's relevant to stay through over a hundred years later. All thanks to this futurism that it harvests. The dynamics of what it means to play together and what holds the group and act without a necessity to obliterate individual fantasies was another great discovery for me. I was fascinated with how musicians of that epoch played together. With the utmost respect towards the musicians who are playing with, you can indulge in what you are playing and drift off as far as you like, knowing that another player or the singer will do you like you. I then talk about um, a semi improvised piece by the Rafi Bana and Hamad Al who is a common player, and a semi show of a And it's described that it feels as though we are effortlessly and freely moving back and forth through time, transcending oversimplified and rigid musical rules, allowing for some sort of time travel, reaching out to each other for common thoughts that is only lyrics. I later on discovered the whole improvs in the US and the improvs in Europe, and I found a lot of similarities between that dynamic of playing in the classical art music for instance, um, one of my recent sessions also, or I told them, and Shabon Liz, and people from that. Um, um. And then I started writing the pieces, and um, I was listening to a lot of music from Montreal, from the amazing improvs in Montreal and decided to rearrange the, the music that I was writing there in Montreal with uh, 20 musicians from the improv scene in Montreal. In 2016, I went there and recorded with them, and the album came to me. Um, this is the artwork of the album. Um, this is actually a sleeve that inside that has all the information. And this is a painting by a friend of mine, Ronald Garan. He's an Egyptian painter. And inside, we used bits and pieces from his painting to create the sleeve and insert. So these are the lyrics and the credits that are uh, translated. Um, and I'm going to leave you with a bit of a taste uh, with that classical Arab music that I'm talking about. Hopefully, you can't find it here, but they are usually 10 minutes, 15 minutes long. But, so.
thanks to all of you for coming. This is very much <laughs> Photography has always been a passion. Passion for the medium to capture an image that speaks beyond the walls and transcends all barriers, but also the fascination for the magic of light and composition. I am interested in making photographs, not taking photographs. And autonomous photography offers freedom to develop my own creative awareness. Women are central in my work. They are an inexhaustible source of inspiration. I started to work in black and white. I found it the most powerful technique to convey my message. And I have developed a deep and intimate relationship with black and white through the years. What really get me into the photography I practice today is because I couldn't identify myself with the local visual landscape in which I live. It was made of stereotype representation about Africa, an Africa torn by wars, epidemics, and famines. African women were often depicted submissive, exotic, and confined to a certain world. My work begins and break with all this stereotypes representation. I emphasize this on the symbolic and aesthetic dimension using harmonious compositions. I lay the focus on gesture, expression, and emotions, and show better mind and feels women. The series symbols. The series symbols, in the series symbols, I use uh, certain materials, background, or structures from nature, such as tree trunk, sandy soil, and other elements that symbolize our bond with the earth. Photography allowed me to reconnect with my roots, my heritage. I explore things related to identity, alterity, duality, communion, and communication. I would like to share some key moments that mark a turning point in my career. In 1985, this is my very first picture, I had my first soul exhibition in Amsterdam. In 1995, right after the abolition of apartheid, I was invited to South Africa to show my photographs. All that symbolized the new post apartheid nation, the rainbow nation. I intervened in art schools through and townships, through lectures portfolio review, and I conducted workshops alongside a drawing exhibition. This educational component of my work has been very rewarding and enriching because I understood the importance of transmitting knowledge to younger generation and to sharing experiences. In 2000, I started with the Noir series, where I showed the relationship between the inner and the outer. All the attributes that you have seen before in my work have been laid out. White is only present in black, to show the black identity from inside out, in all its simplicity and purity. In 2005, I made it from the transition from black and white to color. I always say that color came to me and I embraced them for a certain level of exaltation can only be expressed in color. In 
2016, I had my first retrospective exhibition of 30 years of photography in Dakar, Senegal. Aurelia Pons was made in 2018. And in 2019, affiliation that was partly inspired by the title of this year, the Vienna, where I was show at uh, the Canon Pavilion. 2022 is really a year of consecration. Being a fellow at Civitel and showing at the Venice Vienna, preparing my first solo show in New York, and having my work recently acquired. So I am tremendously thankful. But what counts most is not so much what I have achieved, but the incredible journey that led me to where I am, knowing that the best is yet to come. And some publication. Thank you very much. <laughs> This is a project in town, a major cultural force. Um, Jeffrey Deitch was really instrumental in combining music and this friendly frontier. A lot of my work is the American uh, cultural identity, urgent exploration of my Native American culture at large. This is a direction of being a get the title of this book too. At downtown, it was just an amazing It's important to notice this. Oh, where is it? Whoa, there we go. So I played a number of bands uh, adjacent to my art career because New York was that kind of city you could do everything and anything. You never slept along um, that floor. Now killing it on the With a very early band, I never did saw a band or actually more than a very good band. A quick bit of humor. In around 2001, I started attending some dance. So, and this was a shopping bag for the only own, uh, only own, native owned of the supermarket, which I had missed a lot. Now I got to a painting of the procession. Advertising, I'm not sure of this. <laughs> Billy Jack Jr. said it every time. Stephanie, 50, Stephanie, American TV show. Billy Jack was a sort of a half figure. This is a very major drama. This is a part of the uh, And this will be coming to me soon in Spain, Cordoba, Mexico. What? He told me to say. Community war. So somebody told me this is like uh, Tom or before Tom. I decided to make this uh, a kind of a movie, really, with uh, 
all the links, take pictures on the bottom, and 10,000 on computer. Air between New York, on the growing. We didn't miss. <laughs> lyrics, I love writing lyrics, hate singing. Uh, rap and arts, say you didn't want to rehearse. <laughs> uh, so the drawing before writing to it, you say um, this is the bronze so you know, which is in Arizona, and now just joined a public program in France. I see it over there. Five New York. <laughs> I'm painting on bed sheets, which is what I'm going to be doing here. My boxing days, I'm pretty happy about that. The idea is this bed sheet is like traveling. You can just hold it up where you're carrying it, which relates to the Lakota practice. Winter comes to pieces of linen and then put it in on the train as they travel. My cultural container wall, New York City studio. Uh, I don't know where this is going to be. <laughs> Plains Indian. I like the uh, yeah, tarps, bed sheets, anything that can be plastic. More plastic. Oh. That's the word. Wait, where's that coming from? Yeah, that's it. Pressure is on the camera. One of your own. Love her. My own. Seven. Good skin dolls. Very central. Very busy. And there's our nation in it on that. Thank you. And now we have Mila Kersong's cat from the Ukraine. to Donna Prescott, who's guest away here, to the wonderful staff of Chivitella, Ranieri, to uh, Ilaria Loki, to Greta Cassetti, to Diego Menkeroni, who have become part of our family by now. Uh, well, we just the longest guest we have, we have that Donna has ever had in her life. <laughs> but then, uh, what it is like, I just want to remind you that today is the 100 and 75 day of the war in Ukraine. And uh, this farm, according to official statistics, 5,500 civilian population have died. And about 8,000 of civilian people were wounded. And Ukraine has received 3,000 um, cruise missiles from this little country. Just uh, to remind you, we are sorry. And why we're here. Um, today I will just read one poem uh, which I wrote in 2015. Actually, I included some, some of the pictures, some of the pictures from the past, I don't know whether they, they are here or should be here. Yes. Just, just to show that before the end of it, why a happy and peaceful life, like a normal country, like we're not a disposable material, we are a normal European country where people love to read. We have lots of different books, events, and book forums, and ours is the best young generation, which is fighting for peace and dignity. Okay, I just don't know how.
oh, this is a picture from my dad at my home, and here I'm hugging my cat. It is some publication from, from the Polish magazine, and actually it was a very bad one as well. It was written before this stage of the war. It was written about the animals, the dog of the Donbass, this area in the east of the grave. And uh, when the war began, there were lots, and there are still now, there are lots of abandoned and wounded animals. And so this, this, this poem has become so popular that people were just quoting it in internet without even referring to the author. I mean, because that has really been a, a real serious pain. I mean, not only people who suffer, but lots of animals who just can't stand the disgusting mm -hmm. war. And this is perhaps, oh yeah, this is this is the publication in, in New York. I'm happy with Chivitala. I'm very grateful to Chivitala because here I began my war diary and I had one publication in New York and I had a publication in New York Times, and now a new book of my poems is being prepared in Romanian and in English. And uh, if it were not for, for this place, for the peace of this place, nothing of that would have come out of it. And this is like, yeah, this is me embarrassing. I have some appreciation of my book, and this is our recent book that was published by the Lost Post Press, a country where everyone's name is Fear. It was translated by a wonderful, wonderful poet. Elia Kaminsky and, and a group of other translators. And so here is the poem. Когда страна, в которой живут хорошие люди, постепенно становятся фашистки, хорошие люди замечают это не сразу. Это как незаметный процесс старения, того так близко, что совсем-совсем рядом. Незаметно добавляются новые морщины. Страшные и глубокие. Хорошие люди привычно бывают с ними при встрече, а сами все ниже опускают голову. Наконец, смотреть становится. Спасибо за Next is Forest Sons. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for giving me possibility to speak out and especially thank to Dan who okay give me possibility to make so long story so short <laughs> and, uh, okay i believe it is a part of the mm, art of poetry to make long stories short to put in the several lines sometimes years and sometimes centuries Actually, I was uh, a citizen of Soviet Union for 41 years. What means? I lived in the country without freedom, and everything which I was waiting for, it was forbidden. You know, just nothing. You are going to do psychotherapy in Freudian style. It's forbidden. If you want to write poetry openly, not in honor of Lenin or Communist Party, it is for people. And so, so, I value freedom probably most of the things which I had in my life. My first book were published when I was 56. Now I have a lot of mm, books you know, and the uh, full bookshelf, and yeah, and uh, mm, <laughs> what I do now, now I write another book in the same language as Russian and Ukrainian. I say, okay, I am not an artist, so I can't, nothing to show, 
I am not a musician to present somebody who's what can boy? What can he do? He can present only himself and his poetry in unknown, unknown languages because any translation wouldn't be possible. You see, it is something different. So we can't present nothing, you can't show and show off, I believe. So you know, you can see some fiction. Hey, I am a psychologist and I am a rector of a team. The Institute of Contemporary Psychotherapy, and those pictures will just reflect my life before February 20th. And finally, I will um, okay, um, just read this short poem in a known Russian language. I always say, if you don't want to be well known, just write Russian. You <laughs> want to be less known, just write Ukrainian. <laughs> so, Брат привел войну в наш искалеченный дом. Война — это девочка с банком ходит с трудом. Брат говорит, пусть у вас поживет, а мы погуляем, пойдем. Она у нас еще мама, не мог лучше ей под дождем. Брат ушел, а война осталась, и правду она мала. Хотела помочь в хозяйстве, в кухне пол подмела. Сама какая-то странная, шарится по углам. Из бабушки и сундуков каждый не нужен хлам. А ночью не спит, и нам не уснуть вместе с ней. А днем все молчит, и не было здесь печальных дней. Выбиты в окнах стекла, выслужено жилье, и брат все никак не придет, чтобы увести ее. Of course, we want Boris and Ludmila to be able to go home as soon as they can, but we love having you here. So, thank you. Next is Annie Liu. She is our Lexi Rudinsky Persia First Book Prize Affiliated Fellow from China. Thank you, Dana. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. It's been an incredible gift to be at Chitala and now to get to see and hear the work of the fellows. Um, so, my career so far as a poet and this is, is brief and so simple. Um, this is my first book that I mentioned, Border Vista. Um, I think I will just read to you a few poems, um, but I'll say a little bit about the book first. It's largely drawn from my life, um, very personal poems, and I, as Ben said, I was born in China, and I became kind of an unwitting immigrant to the United States when I was eight, um, when I joined my mother there. And I didn't realize at the time that it would be 17 years before I saw the rest of my family um, to introduce some fellow personal and other habit. Um, and so the poems draw from childhood and into adulthood. And as another fellow often has said, it's really an exploration of intimacy in, in different forms and thinking about while being, you know, contained by a national border, not being able to leave the U.S. to, if I were to want to return, um, it's thinking about how to make a large interior psychic space within that life that otherwise would me. Ars Poetica in a Dream Language. I dream my mother unravels hair out of my mouth. 
In English, she asks me to speak Chinese, coils the hair into a dark gloss, world in her palm. Fluency, I can't unhear my Chinese memories in English. Does that make them American memories? The word rabble means the same thing as a comment, to entangle or anticipate, render incoherent or make plain. And now, in this dream, she leads me to muddle her hair in my mouth, a thin silk slip with saliva. I render into shapes that look nothing in my hair. Once, but no longer, Rahul meant to waste, spoil, or destroy the thing as by pulling her fabric into threads. If we allow for obsolete meanings, then let me also go back in time to the original state, examine at length what is free, because what is obscure becomes obsolete, leaving a thin trail of threads. And when I look back, I see the path, hair dark. And Memory in a foreign language. Weekday afternoons, I walk from school to the English class in the foreign language university. The air is the color of amber, or it is only this way in memory, which has stained it like a film in the nursery. Here I learn a language. It's the way someone you love looks when speaking it. And English is my mother, moving her face in ways she does not at home. Long, cursed, old, wide smile, that's almost a grimace. The lesson underway sounds with the letter I mimic the sounds, my voice swallowed by the clasp. I stretch my mouth and feel the shape of what I don't yet understand, chanting, luck, luck, walk, luck, luck, walk. And what happens next, I don't remember yet. So the, the writing of these poems, some of which we pick up by excavation and a kind of remembering of the past that couldn't be possible except in English. <laughs> um, I'll read just one more. Um, and Alvin and I are going to do a joint presentation on Monday, and so I hope I'll see some of you there and do the more poems. Six years old, my classmates and I believe we invented this game of jumping from great heights of punishing our bodies for their softness. As if, by sustaining enough pain, we could be tumbled, tough, and world-proofed against hurt. I am young enough to still believe that old saying about eating this. But there is one girl who refuses to play. Standing on the edge of the cement stage, she wears a, a dress the color of a white fish open on the butcher board. The skin on her face seems brand new, never ruined by sun, by exertion, by the gritty yellow dirt. She would have to learn how to fall. The crowd of our classmates gathers to meet us, their hard little faces like mine, smeared with salt and dirt, our red scarves are not at our throats. My hands bind her shoulders, pillowy and warm. All it takes is one quick show. She is free of the stage and sailing, pale arms akimbo, soft whimper of surprise, to land face first in the ground. When the teacher reaches her, asking, Who did this to you? Her voice is choked full of blood, and no one dares say that it is my name, she repeats like a trash song. But I know it was me. It was me. It was me. Thank you. And next from Nigeria is Adewale Maja Case. Essays and number. This is about a gallery 
returns to Nigeria to make claims of property and heritage from my father. After inheriting from the southern tenants, and this is the story of when I can find the first one and got it. I'm going to use some what we call Nigerian pigeon, but I hope you'll understand. Prince brought me up at five in the morning. He was only dressed in front of cheap clothing. Well, what's wrong with you? He said, with his usual urgency. How can we still be sleeping by this time? Some of his boys will still be here. I popped out of one of the balcony seats. He asked me to go in the joint to have a picture. Shine my hands, he said, as he put it. And they told me to hide the sun, because the police would, too, would also be around, and it should leave nothing to chance. Then he asked for money for a bottle of charcoal. I took off to wait for them at the junction. The local resident of the association had recently erected a security gate in response to the threatening state of our brother, and Prince was a man who left nothing to chance. Fortunately, the electricity was on, so I busied, I busied myself with the final touches to the election handbook, which I had due to uh, de deliver later that same day. I had to get it generated my own, believing, as I did in those days, government's promises to fix this for that problem in six months, one year, two years. It was fully light when we returned to Sunday at six of the boys, plus two armed policemen. Sunday showed me the relevant paper and pointed to a figure, 123,000 naira, representing mean profit, the legal term for the accumulated rent set by the lower lower court and I had changed out in four years previously. This was an unexpected bonus. I showed him from Gozi's door. When they finally roused her, she refused her. What would have been said in a voice clearly put a panic to go downstairs so that she could see them from the balcony. They were evidently used to this and obliged with good grace. Whereupon the Alhaji, drawn by the commotion, came charging out. Who are you? What do you want? He demanded of somebody, who momentarily looked out for I thought he was the landlord. The prince immediately laid his fears. Don't like him. He is just another tenant. Carry on with your work. He turned to the election. Go back to your house. The, the, your turn is soon coming. You, the Alhaji said. You. So you're a lawyer. That is why I've been seeing you carrying fires up and down. Yes, I've been seeing you coming and joining. Prince laughed. Lawyer? Me? Yes, I saw you. You think I didn't notice? You think you can come just like that? I'll kill you. Let me tell you, I'll kill you. Prince laughed again. I'll ask you. You can kill me if you want, when the time comes. But if they could kill me so easily, I'll already be dead. Anyway, he added, this is not the best way to help your girlfriend. Why don't you go off and her a duplex? I can't find your husband. Go and what girlfriend? Find his wife. Then turn the husband to my friend's business. We can't put him next. The Alhaji did it for a moment, and the life of such as he let back in the The girl, meanwhile, was demanded to see the papers. Sunday obligingly passed them to them and handed them the papers. She looked at them and then turned to the policeman. Policeman. And who are you? One of them laughed and pointed to your tongue. Madam, you are police officers. You might not be here. If you like, you can go and confirm it. Shh. But the case is still in court, she said, laughing. Madam, we will give you five minutes and then we will break down the door. He turned to me. Did she have a car? I pointed it out. It was in good condition, well maintained. We went back upstairs, suddenly not again, loud at the sound, still to refuse to open, saying to the other side that we, we should wait for the lawyer who was on his way. Suddenly shot and gestured to one of the boys, who reached into his bag for an instrument and hit the lock. The door swallowed him. Where are your car keys? Suddenly demanded as they were sworn in. And so began the first of the three evictions I the three evictions. I turned to my staff and busied myself in finishing the handbook. My friend Jock had appeared. It was unusual for her to come so early in the day. I think that anticipating the drama she relished in her own life she brought to mind. All the same, she could have come to better time. I think Gozi discovered when she emerged from the flat in tears. The curse of being a bastard. At the same time, the Alhaji came badly up the stairs to insist that I was an imposter and not part of the Pierce family I claimed to belong to. Jockey flew out. Shut up your mouth, you fucking bitch. 
Otherwise, I'll slap and just uh, between as I did. I trade about two inches away from the victories. As part up as I've ever seen anyone. Even Prince, who had come out to confront me in Hatching, was taken aback. Look at her, breachy, breachy, she sneered. This is merely rhetorical. The good was naturally yellow, without which the twiggling blotches from the lightning skin ointments were going to be banned but freely available. The chicken and good retreated to a trap. The prince proudly ordered the Amateur back downstairs to wait for her turn, which he did with surprising neatness. Yes! How do you think of this now? First fellow from Singapore, the New York Times writer from Singapore. Thank you, Dana, Maria, Diego, Greta, and everyone for having me. For the past week, I have been making myself at home in the 15th century castle of Chukpela, Grenier. There are sweet with hay, summer vegetables, garden herbs, and the ogivine air of the ingredients that surround us. It is utterly unlike my home city of Singapore, apart from the temperature. <laughs> it is also comforting, even comfortable. In its affordances of quiet, vista, clean air, stretch space, generous food, and most of all, free time. The residency team work hard to make a home for artists, writers, and musicians. They tend to our needs and then leave us free to tend to our own processes. What we experience is their love for the land, for the place, and for the mysterious and fickle weather of creativity under which we labor and seek nourishment. In the past 30 years or so, I've often written about Singapore, but I often also don't want to be in Singapore. <laughs> my creative energies are always pulling me elsewhere than home, meaning my place of residence, my domicile. A fellow resident artist yet asked whether I do most of my work at home. I replied that some part of my creative process always involves being outdoors or elsewhere than my usual desk at home, that I find the tension between staying and going, the familiar settled here and the fluid there simulated. One of the definitions of home in the Oxford English Dictionary is a place or condition in which something thrives. In that sense, my creative spirit called this electric gradient home. My physical body, another kind of home, needs rest, but it also needs movement. It creates comfort, but it's also curious for sensory input. Intimacy, to me, is really a puncturing of a loneliness through encounter with an other. It is the gift of vulnerability, which can otherwise evoke anxiety or terror. In the same way, a castle's primary purpose is fortification against pregnability. It is warm as tea, keeping out and keeping in. When these parameters are defined with some balance, trade and traffic become bottled. A castle that is absolutely impermeable, that lacks doors and windows, that this allows the passage of water, air, sustenance, occupants, visitors, is lethal and lifeless. What I mean by a home might be a kind of managed and manageable hierarchy, a translucency, a permissiveness, an open well, not a closed end. The poet Robert Cross has written somewhat so sardonically that home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. <laughs> home in this sense is that which is permeable to us, that lets us in, even as so many structures in the world are about filtering us out in various ways. Orders, standards, categories, labels, qualifications, genres, genders, institutions, proprieties, budgets, disciplines. At the same time, there are also situations that shape what we know, that crack our sense of form, that are impervious in their ineffability. The death of a loved one, for instance, 
of many of these cities wall, a spit of steel against a neck. But it could also be the birth of a child, the discovery of a secret, the birth of a touch, long missed after the spell of denial or absence. It is not our place in the world, but the world's place in us that I want to think about during my stay here. But I am also inclined to wonder, can one abide, learn to inhabit a state not of homelessness but home looseness? Is it the distinctive trait of the artist to be nomadic in this tradition to seek sail over shore even as we are stemmed in one ground or another? Do our walls walk with us always? Are we the ones for whom a window is always open, a door unlatched, springing leaks to and from the unholy world? These are some of the questions that will haunt my writing here in the weeks to come. Thank you for having me. Mario Roberts is a composer from the United States, and she's unzipping her. I don't improvise a lot, um, but writing stuff down and writing for the instruments has had to have more of my practice lately. Um, so the project that I'm working on here is something that I started in 2020. I went to the work hall between the US and Mexico and drove the entire way um, with really sensitive microphones and I put them on the wall to record the sound of the wall that the internal sound makes and the air moves around it. Um, so I have all these beautiful field recordings from there and I'm ready kind of an hour long to shoot. Um, that's going to be for the multiple instruments um, and the two recordings. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to play a very short uh, version of a piece I wrote a couple years ago. Um, and it kind of relates to the theme here because I've always been really interested in the physicality of sound, the way in which it moves us and shapes us, and uh, maybe to, to the nature of my instrument, which is a very beautiful instrument. Um, so the piece I kind of wrote thinking about Spot the spots and energy began um, the way that electricity works. Thank <laughs> you. 
my second attempt because like, I got COVID last year and couldn't come. So I'm really thankful to be able to come this time around. So. Well, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, make sure I don't get gonged. This is my own time run. I'm not going to stand right. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you today briefly about two of the most recent exhibitions, uh, one of which is still on view in the States. Um, so when I first began this new body of work, I was seeking an answer to a question that had been on my mind for years. How do I bring two distinctive bodies of my work and my practice together? Essentially, what does it look like when my collages, or my collage installations, and my paintings on canvas have a baby? <laughs> <laughs> I investigated this question for years, and the combination of a visit to the Peggy Guggenheim collection in 2019 coupled with a desire to make work that allowed my dad and other visually impaired people to experience it, led to the work that I'm making now. What truly fueled the work um, was that in the span of two weeks this past December, I lost two of my biggest supporters. My mentor and honorary uncle Greg Tate, who was an incredible writer and musician, and my father, Joseph Franks, both within a few weeks of each other. It was really important to me that the work I made allowed my dad to experience it without having to see it. My father, who was a pulmonologist, a doctor, had completely lost his sight nearly a decade ago, and he could still use a phone and computer better than any of us this room. <laughs> so my first solo museum ex exhibit at the Queen's Museum in 2019 was an immersive installation and the first time that my father was able to feel my work. Soon after, I was finally able to create paintings that allow for a similar experience. So this work um, is from my solo exhibition, Pretend Gravitas and Dream of Warded Gibbons, which was presented this past April at Kagosian's Park and 73 location in New York City. The title was drawn from an essay that Greg Tate wrote about my work back in 2011. This new body of work, what I call dimensional assemblage paintings, were able to achieve a number of things. They allow the visually impaired to experience my work. The materiality of wood was able to address scale, depth, and perspective, similar to collage. And they utilize the language of collage, printmaking, and painting to speak through a surrealist lens that explores black feminhood, psychological, and visual ways of being. This work addresses issues of identity as informed by autobiography, fiction, myth, collective memory, and history. I combine figuration and abstraction, imagining hybrid figures and distinctive configurations, engaging with the elements of nature, and embodying physical, emotional, and metaphysical growth and transformation. The question that I set out to answer with this new series was, what does the body, particularly the Black, queer, femme body, look like as an utopic space and not just existing in one? And these are some, some installation shots of the show. All this work was made miraculously in the last five months, um, this year alone. Don't ask me how, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, and they're all about uh, four by five feet, so about 1.2, one and a half meters. My current exhibition, currently on view at the Curvy Museum of Art in Manchester, New Hampshire, is a collaboration between myself and composer Liz Gray. And for this exhibition, we researched Black history in New Hampshire and visited the Portsmouth African Burial Ground, among other sites. Utilizing this research, I've created an installation that reflects on the concept of rootedness and flight. 
The aim was to create an immersive space that transports the viewer into a spiritual and celestial dimension, honoring the ancestors that were interred in that community. Liz Gray's research inspired a sound piece that recreates the site specific environments of Manchester and Portsmouth. This piece um, will evolve over time to include recordings from visitors in response to the installation. So there's also a separate room that uh, Liz set up where people could record themselves anonymously and to be included in, in her composition. Ultimately, I explored the question, how can one imagine oneself in the future of a past in which one has been rendered invisible? And so I'm going to leave you with 40 seconds to spare <laughs> with the installation uh, video and the uh, composition by Liz Ray called director's guest here. She is a scholar in the USA and Italy. And tomorrow evening she'll be giving an in-depth lecture. So we hope you can go back for that. No. So, stunned by the great beauty of uh, images and uh, voices and sounds and words, or conscious about being just a scholar. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but there we go. It's my kids. Um, we think of the movie studio as a circumscribed space holding an ensemble of sound stages cameras, lighting, sound equipment, editing suites, labs, workshops for sets, flats and costumes, and dressing rooms of all sorts. It's a complex apparatus which enables the industrial production and artistic creation of the movies. Perhaps due to its being a closed, restricted, and secretive place, the studio has a special aura, set apart from the world outside so as to better serve the construction and the potency of the movie world on the screen. And when we're carried away by these projections of our dreams and desires, the studio structure and economy, the technical equipment uh, and production process, the labor and laborers, the constructions of montage, all the devices and manipulations of movie making, all seem to dissolve. What happens to such a factory of dreams when sand gets caught in the gears, when the mechanism grinds to a halt with a terrible screeching sound, when invaded by occupying armies, prisoners of war, partisans, war criminals, intelligence agents, and refugees from the world over? What happens when the studio itself becomes part of the theater of war? When it becomes an actual site of violent, chaotic, wartime reality? Having explored in my earlier work the use of Italian landscapes, both natural and urban as film locations, my research has led me, by a serendipitous path, to study this particular studio, Kinechita, as itself a location. Located nine kilometers southeast of Rome, among yawning patches of peripheral wasteland 
and never shrinking pastures, in the vicinity of sacred springs that feed the fountains of Rome, are also the monumental remains um, of ancient aqueducts. Some of their arches still sustain improvised shacks that have sheltered the homeless in this area, including people displaced by war, state POWs, retreating German soldiers. But Chinachita, an invention of the fascist era, was a state-of-the-art studio, the biggest in Europe. The traffic between Chinachita and the city of Rome has been reciprocal. Um, with ideas, talent, and labor streaming from the city, while the fortunes and fame amassed here invigorated the internal city. The modern mobility and mutability of movie making were joined here with a high controlled space, a walled and gated miniature city, where artisanal craftsmanship handled to this day through family traditions has been so well employed by the most discerning filmmakers. The interplay between location and set and center and periphery, between material reality and the world making powers of the movies, between cinema and history, specifically the Second World War, has been the topic of my research since my time at the American Academy. I've published some of the research, so that's my bit of self-promotion. <laughs> and there's a documentary film inspired by it. Then I did very different things, but Chile and Chita continue to haunt me, and in recent years I've returned only to discover ever more, ever more astonishing traces of strange events things you shouldn't really find in a movie studio, and stranger than any of the official chronicles of Chine Chita have ever told. I maintain in my work that the studio wasn't just a receptacle to wartime events that invaded it. It was not just a passive backdrop. Rather, it exerted its own pressure on that reality, affecting transformations, prompting action, and at times, as I'll show tomorrow, giving rise to uncanny scenarios. These days I'm working on the introduction, uh, introductory passages for my book, starting with some of the broader questions that arise from the intertwining of war and cinema on the studio grounds. What, would it, what was it like here in the 1940s, those years of total war that affected all populations, demolished cities, annihilated millions, displaced millions more, throwing into utter chaos every aspect of life? It's been said that the cinema, the big sister of all moving image arts and media, the cinema proceeds from a powerful conjunction of the same kinds of forces that inform developments in war. Industrial technologies, the exploitation of resources, the fragmentation uh, and recompositing perception, the manipulation of images, all of these sustain both modern warfare and filming. In each chapter, I ask then from a different angle, and given the wild transformations of war, how we can think through the cinema, through actual filmmaking practices, and with a film scholar's toolkit, how to think about the ways in which history was put together at that time, and how does it foreshadow our own media saturated reality. So, this is also the trailer for my talk tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Ellen van Nierven, and they are a writer from Australia. Ciao. Chinguri <laughs> Jindalami. Hello, everybody. Jindiwala, how are we going? How's everyone feeling? Um, Hope you're all comfortable in this tea. If you are feeling unwell, please let us know. There's water available and there's an opportunity to get a little bit of space. But we really appreciate you all being here today. Um, I am not the first Indigenous Australian writer to be here. I'm actually the second, I believe. Um, Ali Kobiakumun was here a few years ago. Um, she's a Kolkata woman, um, really inspiring poet. 
I myself and take a lot of inspiration from Ali and um, she called me because she saw that I was coming and she she said, you've got to represent. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's, it's a really exciting time for Indigenous Australian writing at the moment and I will be happy to provide recommendations if you want to talk to me afterwards. It's, it's There's a lot of really interesting work. Oysters Shell Netflix. I didn't fill the bay or make the rocks. I didn't. Here Tassie's haunted. Wasn't sure how I feel. I feel water in your welcome. The clouds, the blood, water. All feed, feeds oil. Mud oysters, mutton birds, all feeds. Parting gift, shell in your hands, now in my hands. On your neck, now on my neck. Safe travel, with shells stringed close. Puppy, close. Flight feathers. Mob of pelicans, big way here, crowding that tree like a family photo. Don't feel it, it's bad air. From the top of the lake to the mountains is tree war country. Light catches pink throats of conflict. Make a boat traditional way and cover this lake. Make a death traditional way and cover this page. We want something back from this water. Taste the salt, but not the tears. And the pelicans are leaving us like a line of words, quicker than the tongue. Drift, glide, sail, waft, fly. Fly away. Something happened here. Thank you, Gatsi. Presentations next is Wilmer Wilson the fourth. He is our Pew Foundation fellow uh, from the United States. Hey everybody, um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Chikitala for allowing me this time and space. Um, it's been a huge gift, and I'm really grateful for every single day. Um, let me stop that timer real quick. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to talk about um, two older works in particular, and I'm going to talk about um, the most recent work that I presented for a show um, this past spring called To Lessen the Demand of Visibility. Um, and I'm discussing notes, so I'm going to like switch between reading from those and uh, just annotating what I say. Um, I came to art making through photography. These are um, silver gelatin prints. I realized first through photographic techniques that art could impact the way it felt to have a body, or the way that it felt for bodies to constitute space together. Um, so after that early photographic work, um, I started making performances, um, trying to put those transformations into practice, um, like trying to bring speculative modes of embodiment, complete with their own augmented appendages um, and organs, into the social spaces of urban centers in the eastern U.S. Um, and orienting myself towards the body for the possibilities of embodiment um, has persisted as a central organizing interest in my work. 
Um, I'm interested in making or using objects that are meant to be experienced by an audience of other objects. Um, I struggled to delineate where my performance practice ends and sculpture begins because of that interest in objects. Um, but I've been recently working predominantly in what's typically referred to as sculpture in recent years. Um, similar to the performances, um, I've been making these skin-like coverings that coat the surface of a photographic portrait. I've come to think of these as viewing devices for photographs of me, um, maybe more eye-like as an organ than skin-like. Um, and these are, this is a surface made of um, stains. So it's about 200,000 stains um, covering like a four by eight foot sheet. And I want to say also that I, um, Realized yesterday, um, seeing those Pierre and Francesca works, um, that I like was inspired to work at the scale um, from seeing frescoes um, in, uh, in 2014. So um, that's the really like, useful yeah. image for me. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of these as viewing devices for photographs underneath. Um, I think of them as provisional lenticular lenses assembled from fasteners commonly used in vernacular image cultures. I've been using staples and pushpins. These are a few of the staple works. Um, both the staple and pushpin services provide some antagonism to the gaze. Um, they demand various kinds of active viewership in order to obtain information about the figure of the uh, they amplify raking light according to the orientation in which they're pressed into the light. Um, the figures underneath are granted some anonymity without being completely locked in. Um, these are the most recent works um, utilizing pushpins, and they're on these cylindrical, cylindrical-like structures. Um, the composition is kind of endless or, or has an animated quality to it. And they're hard, yeah, I think uh, people think of uh, visual artists as having something to share in these presentations, but I, I have a, even though I love photography and it came to art through photography, I have a very deep suspicion of it at the same time. So I, uh, please bear with me, you know, uh, sharing the difficulty presenting these works. Uh, I don't compress into a photograph. Yeah, there's a lot of, of labor, um, repetitive labor involved um, in the work. Um, yeah, I sort of am very interested in this compositional device of the skin of drawing together um, small elements into a large surface. Um, and that's about five minutes. Yeah, um, I'll leave. <laughs> Our last presentation is from Naomi Wood, writer from the UK. For a while, Mason had wanted to spice things up in the bedroom. If we don't make an effort now, there won't be anything left to improve, he had said. And though I knew he was right, I was also very tired. I was always with the kids, his work was crazy. Even sex once a week was an effort, and as soon as we got into bed, its warmth often overpowered us. When I thought about our lives, I thought about the therapy pie shops on the internet, where they cut the pie into slices of time, like, here's your pie for work, your pie for sleep, your pie for kids. And I knew our sex pie was so thin it could barely stand up on its own. More of the pie had to be given to sex. All the websites said that. 
They also said that if you don't have sex now, you can't have sex later. And I knew we couldn't stay on this minimal sex percentage forever, but we were both so tired. I also spent a lot of my time communing with the kids. I think Mason was a little jealous of my romance with Ida, Six, and Casper, One. Often, I felt so love-struck with my babies. Mason was always having to pull me out of their beds because I'd fallen asleep, generally communing amygdala to amygdala. Sometimes it felt as if both babies were still inside me. I have read that Y chromosomes of boy fetuses have been found in the bones of dead mothers. Once they are inside you, they are inside you forever. Sweeping through you with a Coriolis force that meant I love you, you drive me nuts, I love you, you drive me nuts, which would, would, which would bore down to Australia before you got to the end. And besides, it always ended up with I love you because that's the way it went with your kids. This is how my love felt for Ida and Casper. Bone deep, viral. A good deal of my pie chart, by like also maybe 8%, was also spent tracking the global amount of the polar ice shelves, according to the NASA website, which was a large percentage, particularly in comparison to the zero point something of our sex life. My capacity to worry about anything really was capacious, even profound, though I personally could not see how anyone slept at them, with floods, intensified storms, and freak supercanes were already bearing down upon us. The other mothers at rhyme time could see it in me, this craziness, this relentless worry. They avoided me and talked with each other. I sang the nursery rhymes, but with very little heart. Sometimes I talked to them, but it always ended up in eco doom. Do you think our babies have a future? I say, will it be too hot to breathe? But they did not want to hear of our babies' extinctions. They wanted to sing all that Donald with her farm over and over, though the farm would be ashes, the animals charcoal, and McDonald's and the kitty would burned in their beds. When I decided to ask about climate change, I leveled with her. It's all our fault, I said, but mostly Granny and Granddad, Cherry and Zishin, her mama and yet yet. Then I would run around butt naked in the house screaming, the world is on fire, the world is on fire, while Casper played with his new bottle, mauling the nipple with his teeth. Mason, I said in the middle of one night, do our kids have a future? I'm asleep. I know Mason, but I'm scared. You're always scared, whereas I have almost no opportunity to sleep. This seemed too good to have been made up on the spot. Did you practice that? Maybe, he said, rolling over. And I thought he really was asleep, but then he said, you need to decatastrophize. None of this actually helps the world. This is why I'm not for me, I meant to say. The world on fire is not arousing. But in the morning, I gave Mason a blowjob as a way of saying sorry that I woke him and sorry that our sex fire was so very thin. Thanks, he said afterwards, we needed that. Mason was a celebrity mental health nurse. Day in, day out, he was saving the lives of all the teenagers butchered by the internet. It's hateful gossip, it's rancorous memes, it's 24-7 bullying. He listened to teenagers talk him through their suicide plans, and then he had to carry that home. Sometimes I read his Twitter feed to see what he was feeling, to trace the graphs curve of, year, of years spent in the NHS X, and his personal sense of failure to the kids he had lost in his high security ward. Why? That morning, the morning of the BJ, he put out the stuff for breakfast and whistled as he went. I wondered if I had chimerically morphed with the kids, whether his brain might be equally co-mobile with his dick. We've heard 16 presentations this evening. I really want to thank the fellows. It's not easy to do in five minutes. And we hope there'll be more presentations so you can hear more tomorrow. We can know as Ben as we mentioned, and then there'll be others coming down the road on Monday evening uh, to poets. Thank you all for coming. Take care.